please find your seats. We're getting ready to start for the next part of our program and our last speaker free lunch, so we can all look forward to that as well. Good morning, everyone. My name is Scott Schrader. I'm a member of the Board of Directors for the Abraham Lincoln Institute. It is my privilege to introduce our next program and our next speaker. On a spring day in 1831, a young Abraham Lincoln, while traveling along the Sangamon River in Illinois, famously got his flat boat hung up in a shallow area of the river. Sometime later, in 1848, Lincoln encountered a steamboat stuck on some shoals in the Detroit River. We wouldn't have wanted to travel with Mr. Lincoln, I don't think, would we? <laughs> Incidents such as those, as those certainly frustrated 19th century travelers and merchants alike. But they also posed a challenge to the scientific mind of Mr. Lincoln. For in 1849, he was granted a patent. Patent number 6469. Now I know everybody's uh, number for their automated withdrawal, right? Everyone's <laughs> pin number is now just changed to 6469. The patent number was assigned to his invention, a device that would lift boats over shoals or shallows and rivers. Though this device itself was never actually built or put into use, he was, and still is, the only U.S. president to hold a patent. Lincoln's interest in science did not begin nor end with this patent. Yet for all of the numerous volumes written about the 16th president, a relatively few have focused on his interest in science. And of those that have, a very few, or perhaps none, have been full-length studies. Until nowadays. Thankfully, our next speaker has stepped up to fill that inexplicable gap in Lincoln-related scholarship. His book is called Lincoln, The Fire of Genius, How Abraham Lincoln's Commitment to Science and Technology Helped Modernize America. That book and Lincoln's relationship to science will be the topic that our speaker will speak about today. David J. Kent, our next speaker, is uniquely positioned to explore Abraham Lincoln's relationship with science as he is both a Lincoln historian and a former career scientist. He is the current president of the Lincoln Group of the District of Columbia and serves as a member of the executive committee for the, or for the um, Abraham Lincoln Institute. He also serves on the board of advisors for the Lincoln Forum. In addition to the book that he will be speaking about today, his previous writing projects include books about Nikola Tesla and Thomas Edison as well as a fantastic book for young adults titled Lincoln, The Man Who Saved America. So now, without further delay, please join me in welcoming to the Ford's Theater stage, David J. Kent. Science of military strategy. 
So today I want you to transport yourself, your mind, into the main reading room of the Jefferson Building. And I know a lot of people in this room have been there and to the other reading rooms. Okay, so go into the reading room, go all the way to the center where they have a circular desk, and look up. You see painted on the inside of the dome is a circular mural by Edwin Howland Blashfield. And in that circular mural, there are 12 seated figures, <clears throat> excuse me, which in turn reflect the 12 countries or epics which Blashfield felt contributed most to American civilization. To the immediate right of each figure is a tablet, which is inscribed whatever the country is that's being typified. And below that is an outstanding contribution to the country of the, that country to the human progress. So the figures follow in chronological order. And they start with Egypt, which represents written records. If you go all the way around the mural to the 12th and final figure, uh, you'll see that it represents America. And the America's outstanding contribution to human progress is the field of science. And the explanation for the mural uh, describes the scenes that follows. Cool. The figure, an engineer whose face was modeled from Abraham Lincoln's, sits in his machine shop pondering a problem with mechanics. In front of him is an electric dynamo representing the American contribution to the advancement of electricity. Close quote. So we have a Lincoln figure representing America, representing science, and that represented by an electric dynamo, which is another name, just an electrical generator. So on this circular mural, immediately before Lincoln, is a mural is in France. And France's contribution is emancipation because of the Declaration of the Rights of Man, which the French Assembly uh, signed in 1789. So you have the depiction of Lincoln as a representative of American science. To me, it ref uh, reflects the significance that he placed on it during his lifetime. The juxtaposition of Lincoln bracketed by emancipation on one side and science on the other is intentional and I think a pretty good summation of his contributions to the modernization of America. Now, of course, Lincoln was no engineer, uh, but Blashfield's use of Lincoln's face and the posture reminiscent of Rodin's The Thinker uh, to reflect a mechanically minded strategist I think certainly does Lincoln justice. And this connection between Lincoln and Justice and, and science wasn't something that Blashfield made up, it was something that was recognized during his lifetime. Lincoln's contemporaries often commented on his tech law of technology. Now, just to give a couple of quick examples, a co-counsel on a water wheel patent case said Lincoln, quote, had a great mechanical genius. Another colleague said that Lincoln, quote, could understand readily the principles of mechanical action of machinery and had the power in his clear, simple illustrations and style to make the jury comprehend them. Close quote. Now there actually is quite a bit of evidence available that we get a glimpse of Lincoln's understanding of science and technology, and in fact, I wrote a book about it. <laughs> but I'm going to quickly highlight just a couple of documents that, that really bring this up. Now in 1848, Lincoln was on his way back to Illinois between sessions of his single term in Congress. There's two sessions, single term in Congress, he's going back home to do his day job, which is being a lawyer. So on his way home, he, he goes to Buffalo and he takes his family out to Niagara Falls. So following a quick visit to the falls, as well as a stop in town for a shave and a haircut, Lincoln wrote a non, what we call an unfinished fragment. <clears throat> while he's traveling by steamship back through the Great Lakes. In fact, this is the trip where, as Scott mentioned, he saw a motor steamship that was stuck. So in that fragment on Niagara Falls, Lincoln shows he understands quite a lot of science, things like hydrology and geology and erosion and even some paleontology. He shows off his math abilities by calculating the watershed of the river and lake system, 
And by estimating the age of the Earth back to the last ice age, based on simply the rate of erosion in the falls. And in both cases, his calculations were remarkably accurate. In fact, they were almost exact. So the second document I want to talk about uh, briefly is this 1859 lecture on discoveries and inventions. It wasn't one of his better writing efforts, and it's a bit broken up, so it's hard to, to piece it, parse it through. But in it, Lincoln traces the growth of man through technological advancements, both in the development of machinery and in communication. It explains that, quote, man is not the only animal who labors, but he is the only animal who improves his workmanship. This improvement he affects by discoveries and inventions. Close <coughs> It goes on to say that these discoveries and inventions are the result of observation, reflection, and experiment. Now, as a scientist, I look at that and said, hmm, observation, reflection, and experiment. In a nutshell, Lincoln's describing the scientific method. Well, through this and quite a lot of other uh, examples, Lincoln clearly understood more science and more technology than either he or history gives him credit for. So I started to think, where did Lincoln get this appreciation for scientific and technological knowledge? What did he know and how did he know it? So for the first 21 years of his life, remember that Lincoln lived as a subsistence farmer on the frontier for a constant battle against the unbroken force to eke out enough food to survive was the norm. He admits his formal education amounted to less than one year, and that wasn't even all at once. It was by little <coughs> over his entire life, and that the limits of his learning were reading, writing, and ciphering to the rule of three. The qualifications for teachers on the frontier were largely non-existent. And Lincoln says that if a straggler supposed to understand Latin happened to sojourn into the neighborhood, he was looked upon as a wizard. Now, I mean, all of us that study Lincoln know Lincoln wasn't being entirely forthright here. While we complain that frontier schooling offered absolutely nothing to excite ambition for education, Lincoln himself never stopped teaching himself whatever intrigued him, all of which he picked up from time to time under the pressure of necessity. That quote includes science. So Lincoln's science, interest in science, start with practical experience, memories on a farm. Lore passed down from previous generations provided plenty of science on frontier farms. Uh, farmers had to learn the basic sciences of agronomy, or as crop to for production, forest ecology, hydrology, meteorology, climate, and disease. He even had to learn some civil engineering. Building a log cabin sounds easy until it rains. So he had to know how to build this log cabin such that it wouldn't either flood uh, from water running into it or just become part of the rainstorm. Hired out by his father, which were often to other farmers or to split rails, also included helping to build canals in Indiana and Ohio. As Scott mentioned, he took two flatboat trips to New Orleans, where he increased his knowledge of hydrology, mechanics, physics, and geography. Now, if anybody's read Life in Mississippi by Mark Twain, you know, floating down the river isn't as easy as it sounds. So Lincoln also on those trips received his first taste of um, multicultural society and a crash course in the realities of slavery. <coughs> But on the way back, he learned how steam mechanics worked on the steamships that he was taking back from these flatboat trips, and he even learned how to be a riverboat pilot. Through it all, he was absorbing science and technology in a time when rapid technological advancement was just gaining steam. Now, I already mentioned the limits of his formal schooling, but through self-study, Lincoln learned far more mathematics, for example, than a simple rule of three. 
including things like complex division, interest and discount rate calculations, currency conversions. And then the complex geometry and trigonometry needed to become surveyed. Eventually, the logic of Euclid. He continued reading whatever books he could obtain. And while he was in practice with uh, William Harvey, a series of books called the Annual of Scientific Discovery, which is also called the Yearbook of Facts in Science and Art, which is a compilation of uh, scientific advances, little summaries of all these different studies from around the world. Each year, this was put out from 1850 to 1871. And when Lincoln got his first copy from William Herman, he told Herman, go get the rest of it. So they went out and got whatever issues were open to that time. Through these and through other sources, he even taught himself the basics of astronomy. His colleagues were pretty impressed with all of this. You know, they'd be out on the circuit all the time. Circuit judge and later US Supreme Court Justice David Davis noted that Lincoln studied the exact sciences and that, quote, he had a good mechanical mind and knowledge. Another colleague, Joseph Gillespie, later told Herman that Lincoln quote, wanted something solid to rest upon, hence his bias for mathematics and physical sciences, and not so much biology and what. So that Lincoln was drawn to mechanics and inventions shouldn't be all that surprising, and both served him well in his patent law career, and of course later in the Civil War. For self-study, he was always looking to better his condition. Oh, one more thing. He also taught himself the law. So as a lawyer, he was initially focused on simple debt, divorce cases, divorce cases, you know, charge five dollars, and a big deal. And that was still the majority of all of his cases were those sorts of cases. But Lincoln's law practice expanded as his reputation grew. He was fascinated by all this newfangled mechanical equipment he started encountering on the circuit. Started picking up more and more patent and technology cases. <clears throat> in just one example, Lincoln's summation in the F.E. Afton case, which I think most people were pretty know about, helped change the trajectory of commerce, ensuring that railroads would supplant steamships, which ushered in a new era of economic and westward expansion that effectively merged the entire continent into a single market. <coughs> Cases he worked, he, he argued for and against the railroads. Most people know he worked for the railroads, but he also argued, in fact, about half of his cases against the railroads. <clears throat> Established legal precedents that define both corporate and uh, worker rights for decades. He even integrated this fascination with astronomy, strategically employing the almanac to win acquittal for a son of an old friend accused of murder in the Almanac case. And of course, he was also a politician. So as a politician, he became the Whig leader in the Illinois State Legislature, promoting the expansive system of internal improvements to set the stage for rapid growth in manufacturing and industrialization, at least in the northern states. Southern states weren't too keen. Now, Scott mentioned, Lincoln became the only president with a patent for a system that employs the Archimedes principle, the scientific principles of buoyancy and displacement for buoying vessels over shoals. Now that's his most famous invention, but he actually had a couple other small inventions. He devised a kind of water wheel, and he created a small wooden wagon toy for tag that Henry Ford, the car guy, not the Henry Ford Ford Steering, later described as, quote, the original forerunner of the steering system, now developed to such high efficiency in the modern motor car. <coughs> now, by modern, I think it was around 1920, not a modern Tesla, although ironically, most of the early cars were electric. So he invented a couple of little things, but the buoying vessels idea was the only uh, invention he ever patented. But, of course, Lincoln is the only president with a patent. He is not the only president 
who invented things. And if I ask you to call out a president who invented things, Thomas Jefferson immediately comes to mind. Jefferson was actually much more of an inventor than Lincoln, which the docents down in Monticello were all too happy to tell you about. He concocted everything from a clock to a revolving bookstand, a plow, even some scientific instruments. But he never obtained a patent on any of them. This is a little ironic because the Secretary of State under George Washington, that was part of his duty, the patents. So this begs the question, why not? Why didn't he patent anything? And the answer, I think, comes down to the fundamental worldviews of these two men and why it's Abraham Lincoln became so crucial to the modernization of America. So Jefferson believed that the economy should be primarily based on agriculture. He claimed to envision a rolling out of a republic in which small independent farmers would become the foot soldiers of an infant nation and the guardians of its liberty. It sounded really nice in theory. But in reality, of course, Jefferson owned a large plantation and enslaved more than 600 men, women, and children over the course of his lifetime. Inherited wealth, access to formal education, and captive slave labor enabled Jefferson the privilege of intellectual pursuit. He didn't have to worry about patent money because virtually everything he constantly invented benefited primarily himself. He invented things to make his own life easier. So the market value, most of those things was pretty limited, and for him, unnecessary. He just saw no need for a patent system. But in contrast, Lincoln grew up on the frontier, a life he later described as the short and simple annals of the poor. He hardly did hardly any access to formal education, and it was left to him, his father, and later his stepbrother, uh, to do all the labor necessary to sustain a growing family on subsistence farms. From this view of the world, Lincoln understood that most of those on the frontier were at a severe disadvantage when it came to intellectual and material pursuits. The sons and daughters of frontier farmers could easily be relegated to a life of mere survival, based simply on the vagaries of birth and the lack of educational opportunity. And yet, Lincoln felt scientific and technological development could change that. The American system of internal improvements could change that. Railroads could change that. The telegraph could change that. Even the brand new technology that Lincoln embraced of photography could change that. The patent system could change that. So Lincoln ends his 1859 lecture on discoveries and inventions by explaining that prior to the patent system, any man might instantly use what another had invented, so that the inventor had no special advantage from his own invention. Neighbors copies it, that's it. But then came the patent system, which, quote, secured to the inventor for a limited time the exclusive use of his invention, and thereby added a fuel of interest to the fire of genius in the discovery and production of new and useful things. It's a pretty powerful statement. In fact, that model today is engraved on the US patent office. So of course, I took the fire of genius part of that to the title of my book. It reflects the inventiveness, you know, the ingenuity, the innovation, and the creativity that exists in all men and women. But just as important to Lincoln was this fuel of interest, by which he meant financial interest afforded by the patent system. So for a period of maybe 15 years, the inventor could commercialize and promote his invention. He could even get rich on it. So ironically, Lincoln never tried to commercialize his own patent. He saw it as something that would benefit all men. Patents in general would benefit the inventor but Lincoln's patent, in particular, farmers could more easily benefit because they could more easily move their products. Workers could receive financial reward for their ideas. Tradesmen could benefit from being employed to build this new machinery. All of society 
would benefit from increased industrialization and commerce spurred on by patent protection. So while Jefferson was definitely more of a scientist than Lincoln, Jefferson saw science as an intellectual benefit for the few, but Lincoln saw its potential to practically benefit the many. But of course, you know, his commitment to science and technology also played a major role in the Civil War. Uh, Lincoln personally encouraged the development of innovations, everything from more effective weapons, uh, to balloon reconnaissance, to ironclad warships. Uh, he was the first, tele uh, the first president to strategically use the telegraph in wartime. A less known, probably, is that Lincoln also grappled with scientific issues including those related to salt paper, saltpeter for ground, uh, gunpowder, making compasses work when you surround them with ironclad and warships, and the ethics even of poisonous weapons. And when he needed a break from the strains of being commander in chief, he walked down the road to the Naval Observatory to gaze at the stars. It took friends there. So Lincoln, the patent lawyer, was constantly encouraging innovation as president. And one measure of the difference between Lincoln's America and the Confederacy is that during the Civil War, during those four years, the United States government, the Union, the United States government issued more than 30,000 patents. Confederacy, 266. But more importantly, Lincoln institutionalized science within the federal government. Prior to the Civil War, there was very little federal infrastructure for science and technology. Most science was done by the wealthy elites with the time and the resources to hang around in comfortable sitting rooms, cigars and some brandy, and chat about scientific endeavors, much of which was actually being done in Europe. Lincoln changed that. Because during the war, first off, he relied on uh, Joseph Henry, the Smithsonian Institution's first secretary, as, as was mentioned earlier. Joseph Henry became Lincoln's informal science advisor, and anything that had to do with science and technology, Lincoln always called on Joseph Henry. And one of those things is he called on Henry to lead the three-person permanent commission of the Navy, which had just been set up, to evaluate technological advancements through weaponry, whatever else was being proposed for the war effort. A lot of these people had been lining up and coming into the White House to pitch the ideas to Lincoln, because everybody knew Lincoln was a techie guy. But he couldn't handle it all, because there were so many people, so he's, they set up this permanent commission. And Joseph Henry helped guide this permanent commission to toss out the crazy, uh, the crazy ones, and then we're playing with those and get the ones that look promising tested. So Lincoln also signed into, into, into charter the National Academy of Sciences. The National Academy of Sciences helped put the United States on a path to scientific and technological expertise that would rival that of Europe. Lincoln personally lobbied Congress to create the Department of Agriculture to bring the science to farming. Lincoln, the year before he became president, was elected president, he gave a speech at the Wisconsin State Agricultural Fair, where he actually berated farmers. He said, you cannot continue to do ad hoc farming. You must bring science to agriculture. So he pushed Congress to create the Department of Agriculture, and they did so a few months later. He says, the department at that time, and continuing today, began extensive research programs and funded agronomic investigations and it disseminated new research or new knowledge down to farmers directly, big and small. Uh, the department also provided an infrastructure framework to smooth the devastating swings of crop yields affected by floods and droughts and other climatic extremes. Lincoln himself had experienced two major climatic extremes in the course of his early life. First, there was a year without a summer, the year that the last year in Kentucky, and then a winter of deep snows after they had moved to Illinois. But Lincoln wasn't finished. It was Lincoln who 
to set aside the first land for federal and public protection. Yosemite Valley and the Miracles of Road of Big Trees in California was a precursor of the national park system that we all enjoy today. So all of these, all of these efforts are premised on the idea of an active federal government that could, quote, do for a community of people whatever they need to have done but cannot do at all or can also well do by themselves in their separate and individual capacities. When you think about that, you know, what's a good example of And the Department of Agriculture is a good example of that. The Department of Agriculture carry out large-scale scientific research, develop new seeds, evaluate crop rotation and tillage practices, assess nutrient depletion, all of which would be impossible for an individual frontier farmer to do by themselves. So as historian, as historian Richard Steiner described uh, in a book fairly recently, Lincoln quote, provided the basis for the national modernization, long-term planning, and national cohesiveness that turned our nation into a global superpower by the middle of the 20th century. And there was a long tail on what Lincoln had done. Lincoln's innovations were the basis for federal action by future presidents. Franklin Delano Roosevelt's New Deal created the Works Progress Administration and other programs to put Great Depression era Americans to work building and repairing roads, bridges, railroads, parks, South Miller. It was the internal improvements program of his time. Harry S. Truman's Fair Deal continued his philosophy, seeking to turn the wartime economy from World War II into a peacetime economy, which it did. Dwight D. Eisenhower created a national network of interstate highways. It was his internal improvement program of his time. Lyndon Johnson's Great Society sought to finish the work Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation and the three Reconstruction Amendments had started to eliminate poverty and racial injustice. Yeah, that one was still working. Barack Obama's Affordable Care Act and similar legislation brought access to health care for those for whom it was unobtainable, often people living in rural areas who had no access to affordable health care. Now, 10 years ago, in 2013, President Obama addressed the National Academy of Sciences on its 150th anniversary of its creation. And if you do the math, three weeks ago was the 160th anniversary of Lincoln creating signing into law the National Academy of Sciences. Obama noted, quote, President Lincoln had the wisdom to look forward and he recognized that finding a way to harness the highest caliber scientific advice for the government would serve a whole range of long-term goals for the nation. And as we know, Lincoln continues to inspire politicians on both sides of the aisle, which both major parties claim the mantle of the party of Lincoln. Now, Lincoln's inspiration reached scientists as well as politicians. Thomas Edison was 14 years old when the Civil War began, but already adapted to telegraph transmission, blazing a trail to send their news by lightning on the telegraphic wire, as a popular song of the era intoned, and you should be happy I didn't try to sing that. <laughs> Four years later, it was Edison who tapped out a message that Lincoln had been assassinated, and still later, Edison would demonstrate his phonograph at the National Academy of Sciences and meet with Joseph Henry. And after inventing the film projector, one of his first silent films was called The Life of Abraham Lincoln. Edison was so enamored that he placed Lincoln's profile on his own letterhead, writing out a testimonial that Lincoln's life and character would stand as a monument forever. And by the way, it was Edison who ran the World War I iteration of the Permanent Commission, evaluating new technology for the war. Now Lincoln's reputation even reached across the Atlantic Ocean to another scientist that most people might not have heard of, named Michael Kubin, a Serbian immigrant arriving in the United States about a decade after Lincoln's assassination. Kubin named Abraham Lincoln as one of his only two friends in America. Later, he enrolled in night school at Cooper Union because of Lincoln's 1860 speech, and Lincoln and Kubin went on to compete in developing electrical dynamos with another Serbian immigrant that I wrote about, Nikola Tesla. Remember that dynamo in the Library of Congress Bureau? And by the way, it was Lincoln's science, informal science advisor, Joseph Henry, 
who developed the early principles that became the electrical diagram and telecom. Now, as far as scientists, most recently, astrophysicists and recipients of the Lincoln Presidential Foundation's Leadership Prize, Neil deGrasse Tyson, argued that Lincoln was a science champion. Tyson noted that, quote, while most remember honest Abe for war and peace and slavery and freedom, the time has come to remember him for setting our nation on a course of scientifically enlightened governance, without which we may all perish from this earth, close quote. Now, as Americans continue its journey into an uncertain national future, I think we can uh, heed Lincoln's advice to Congress at the end of 1862. The dogmas of the quiet past are inadequate for the stormy present. The occasion is piled high with difficulty, and we must rise to the occasion. As our case is new, so we must think of it and act in it. We must disenthrall ourselves, and then we shall save our country. I'm going to wrap this up and end by asking you again to transport yourself down the road, just your mind again, down the road to the U.S. Capitol. This time stand outside the Capitol and look at the Capitol and again look up. The dome of the Capitol serves as a metaphor, the principal role of government to elevate the condition of men. Unfinished at the beginning of the war, the old copper-clad wooden dome was being replaced by a new cast iron dome. His skeletal ribs were incomplete about Lincoln as he gave his first remarkable address. Lincoln insisted that construction of the dome must go on during the Civil War to show, that, to show the people that its government continued to operate. So by his second, his second inaugural address, a 20-foot tall bronze Statue of Freedom tower atop the completed dome, technology had helped build this huge new structure. Lincoln realized that science and technology could help build the new United States. Thank you all.
uh, but for the Spencer rifle and for what Lincoln dubbed the coffee mill gun, which is an early machine gun, that to him looked like a, a coffee grinder on the top where you put in the shells. Um, he actually told them to do them like this and ordered them to be to, to buy and purchase some of these and put them in service. Other ones he just said, well, it's up to you, but I like it. But Bruce's book goes really into depth and all of that. Um, and, and because he did all of that, there was no need for me to do that. So I didn't go into depth into all of those weapons. What I looked at was where Lincoln played a major role in getting something put into, into service. And there weren't any. Fascinating presentation, David. Thank you very much. Um, did David Lincoln offer any views of his own on the invention of the cotton gin? Well, I think historians have come to the consensus that in some ways, the cotton gin, that particular invention, do end up sort of locking in slavery and expanding slavery in some ways in the United States, whereas perhaps it may have been, as Lincoln put it, on the path towards ultimate extinction and that sort of locked it in and, and, and made sort of grow more. Did he offer any views on, on that one way or the other? And more broadly, any views in general that you saw Lincoln offer on the connection between science and the of slavery? I, I have a chapter that I call The Science of Slavery, and it's not just the uh, arguments that were used, both scientific and pseudo-scientific and pseudo-religious and a mix of all, blend of all of those things that were used to try and justify slavery. I talk about that and I go back into Linnaeus coming up with a categorization of, of, uh, of, of how they categorize animals and organisms and plants in, in society, which is very bio biology. Um, I talk about all of those things. But one of the things I talk about is things like uh, soil nutrition, soil de de depletion, and how important that was to advancing and expanding slavery. Uh, geography in the sense that uh, Thomas Jefferson's uh, Louisiana Purchase doubled more or less the size of the United States. Well, all of that new area was now territory, and it's like, what do we do with it? Do we have slavery there or not? So the expansion into that area, and then after the, the uh, Mexican War, we gained all the rest of that land out to the West Coast. And that, again, raised the same issues. Well, you know, well, it's open, we, got, we didn't put slavery there, right? But that was the big thing. That was, in fact, the Republican Party's main argument was, well, we'll leave it where it is, but we will not let it expand. So, cotton gin. The cotton gin um, was something that nobody anticipated when they were putting together the Constitution. So when you read the Constitution, you have arguments about whether it's an anti-slavery constitution or pro-slavery constitution. The one thing you have to remember was 13 colonies, states. That was it. There wasn't all this other land, there wasn't all these other issues, and there was no cognition. There, there were quite a few people who expected slavery to die of its own immorality, its own way, that it's not a very good long-term system, economic system. Then the cotton gin came around. Eli Whitney created this cotton gin, a very, very easy, very, very simple device that would make it easy to get the seeds out of cotton balls, which is something that you don't think about too much, but once you, you know, how much labor there is involved with picking cotton, that's what people focus on. It's even worse trying to get those seeds out of that cotton, and you needed the cotton fibers to make textiles, to make fibers and make textiles. So the cotton gin strips that out very quickly. So now you could get, you could strip cotton 50 times faster. So it would take you one, you know, X amount of time to get one pound, you now get 50 pounds in that amount of time. Very, very quickly. And Eli Whitney actually thought this would uh, reduce the need for slavery because there would be less labor required to get that. It actually had the opposite effect. Now, because you could get the seeds out quicker, you could be much more profitable if you just planted more cotton fields. And it really, you know, I talk about it in the book, one of the things about the cotton gin, it really started snowballing. I mean, you look at, even at something like the Indian Removal Act of 1830, it was related to the cotton gin, because now you had this way to get cotton much more profitable, and all of the southern landholders said, Cotton farmers wanted more land, and so in the move move these people out of here so we can take over this land, which is a very, very good 
popcorn land. So uh, the cotton gin played, played a very, very large role in expanding uh, slavery. Um, not intentionally, Eli Whitney actually didn't make any money off of it because of uh, patent infringements, because he didn't have like an helping. But he, he didn't make any money off of it. But on the other hand, he did make a lot of money off of developing a, a way to mass produce weapons and not putting together guns and replaceable parts and things like that. He made a lot of money off of that side. So he kind of still helped the union cause, even though cotton gin kind of messed things up, expanded slavery. I got everything that you said. David, I was struck by the ratio of over 30,000 union patents but under, under less than 1% of the South. Can you put that, that in this whole context before the Civil War and, and after the Civil War? I mean, was the South just terrible at inventing things? <laughs> the South, yeah, the, 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 I don't know the numbers before the Civil War, but they, obviously, Civil War stimulated a lot of new ideas. And the South actually um, had some very good innovations, which they were in the forefront of things like ironclads and, and uh, uh, torpedoes and mines and uh, um, submarines because they had to. They didn't have the manpower, they didn't have the manufacturing capability, they had to be innovative. But and they had the same system, patent system, because they just stole the US Constitution and added the pro-slavery stuff to it and basically kept it just the same. So they had the process for, for patenting. They just didn't encourage it. And prior to the war, um, there was a big difference between uh, the North and the South in the idea of internal improvements and, and industrialization, manufacturing, whereas the North was embracing all of that. The South didn't want. Uh, their arguments varied, but they argued that they didn't want manufacturing, they didn't want industrialization because they didn't want the federal government to get too much power. What they were really saying is we don't want the federal government to get into a position where they can get rid of slavery. You know, we don't want too many railroads because you know then these slaves could get on them and escape north. We don't want that. So even there, you saw differences between the North and the South during the war, whereas the railroads became very, very important for both sides, but especially in the North. But they were already, by the time of the war, much more interconnected, networked. They were most, more, mostly the same gauge, and they were designed to move people and products around into in a network. In the South, there were much more different gauges so, different, so they couldn't run on the same tracks, and then they mostly were concerned about how do I get my crop, cotton crop to the port, or to the place where I can sell it. They weren't, they weren't too keen on all of that. So there was a different attitude there. Everything from the transcontinental railroad, which the, the Jefferson Davis actually supported and was pushing for a nice southern route that was going to help expand slavery. And Martin, of course, one of the one of them. It was Lincoln who decided to play. So um, during the war, there was a lot of patenting, and the fact that the South didn't patent much shows that they weren't really invented much because they had a process for it. Uh, even uh, it was much, much, much later that today's South uh, started uh, embracing more, uh, more manufacturing. So there was a there was a mindset difference between the two sides. And Lincoln took advantage of that. He realized that it was an advantage for the North. Telegraph was the same way with the networks, networking. Yes. Thank you. Um, it seems like we have to start calling A the father of STEM. But um, I'm curious, uh, did he, um, you know, I know life took its turns for him, but did he ever show an interest in maybe going back and doing a formal education? Um, no. <laughs> um, yeah, we're, we're, I guess we're getting close, but the, no, he didn't really, I mean, he didn't need to. You know, Lincoln had taught himself pretty much everything he thought he needed to know. He did when he was in Congress, his one term in Congress, and he was starting to associate with all these Easterners that had much more formal education and formal law degrees. 
you know, unlike just reading and just you know, proving that you have good character. Um, in, in the West and in, in the East, people were much more educated, much more um, uh, formalized in what they were doing. And he, he saw all of that and said, you know, realized how all these people were studying new. So he decided to study new. A lot has been, <clears throat> excuse me, written about um, Lincoln's self-taught knowledge of Euclid and how it benefited him in different ways. So I was wondering if you think that Euclid played a role in his speech writing. Yeah, the, uh, there's a book out um, by uh, Dan Hirsch and, and I mean, uh, David Hirsch and David Dan Van Hatton after about Lincoln uh, talking about the structure of reason. It talks about how Lincoln um, used Euclid, which is geometry, Euclid's geometry, but it also is basically logic. And uh, how and they really, they go through the Kensal Address and some other addresses, and they really show how Lincoln used Euclid as a, a format, really, to uh, do his addresses, do the several things, including the second inaugural that Diane was talking about. Um, and they make a pretty good case out of it, and then they go through and they, they make their arguments. I've always been a little bit more hesitant about it, um, in part because uh, it's not so easily transferable as, as, as that, in my mind, at least, having done the equal geometry. Uh, but also, he didn't start studying that until he was 1848, when he was 1849, when he was in Congress. But he had been a lawyer long before that, and he was known already as a logician, somebody who really understood the logical way of, of reaching out to a jury. He was never the best precedent type of lawyer where he could cite precedents. He was more about persuading a jury. And he was very, very good at that. And that takes a lot of logic. In fact, a lot of these technological cases that I talk about in the book, one of the things that he was really, really good at, and one of the quotes that I, I quoted, Lincoln could take this difficult technological stuff, boil it down into something that jurors, you know, your peers could understand. You know, you have a lot of engineers and, and, and uh, scientists on the jury pool. So he, had, he could explain it in his country bumpkin sort of way, which he used to his benefit. Uh, so how much he got, how much of the speeches are from Euclid, I don't know, they, they make a good case, but I still don't know if they're skeptical. But uh, I, think that's, I think that's the last question. So we're, thank you all very much.